Hey, Nathan, we've got a really uh, interesting show today uh, because we're going to be talking about what, dude? We're going to be talking about the best cars you can buy used or new. But here's the twist. If you buy them used, should you buy them new? Or if you bought them new, should you buy them used? Yeah, basically what this list that I see cars put together uh, tells you is what cars depreciate the quickest yeah. and what cars hold their value the longest. Uh, and we're going to go over that. So if you're out there looking for a car, there are some cars you're just better off buying new because they hold their value so well. Uh, and then there are other cars that just depreciate like a rock, so you're better off to buy them used. But before we do that, can I tell you something? Uh, about a documentary I recently watched, which is kind of um, pertinent to today. Is it about apes, like mating? No. Why am I it's the about only cars. one who watches that? Okay, go no, ahead. I didn't watch any apes mating. Yeah, no. All right, no, 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 it's no. just me, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's, uh, it was this um, PBS documentary uh, on Amazon. It cost 49 cents, so you got to pony up some money to watch it. Uh, okay. But it's really cool. It's a Ken Burns documentary. It's called Horatio, uh, The First American Road Trip. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And what this documentary is about is about, obviously, this guy called Horatio, mm -hmm. who uh, married a gal whose dad made a lot of money in the early, like, 1900s, late 1800s, selling a health elixir. Hmm. Okay. That was, like, 20% rye. Okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> That'll make you feel better. <laughs> yeah. And so he's apparently coming back from Alaska, and he uh, is in San Francisco at one of those, you know, um, I don't know what they were, but they were like gentlemen's clubs, you know, where, where the peak guys with the big mustaches and the lamb, uh, lamb chops, just, you know, tap hats. This is 1903, keep in mind. So leather chairs, they're smoking yeah, cigars yeah, yeah. and reading the newspaper. Yeah. Not like a you, gentleman's, like, like, not a modern gentleman's Like you do. Club. Like I do, of course, all yeah, the time. Yes, yeah, I do. except with the, you know, lamb chops. Is it lamb chops? Is that what they're called? Well, well mutton chops. Mutton I think. chops, yeah. yeah. Uh, I was okay. close. Anyway, so there's a group of these guys uh, sitting around a table, uh, and they're having this discussion, and the crux of it is that the car will never replace the beloved horse. Mm -hmm. 1903. And keep in mind, at that time, there were something like 14 million horses in America. Right. And all the jobs associated with them, farriers, right, farriers, the guys who do the hooves, blacksmiths. Mm -hmm. And there were, you know, maybe a couple thousand cars. Taxidermy. Yeah. And he's like, gentlemen... I will bet you $50, puts the money on the table, that I can drive a car from San Francisco to New York in under three months. Hey, podcast listeners and TFL Talk viewers. I wanted to take a minute to talk to you about a quick and simple way to sell your car or truck with the help of our new partner, High Road. With High Road's online portal, you enter your vehicle's VIN number or plate, mileage, and zip code, and you'll get competing offers from several qualified dealers in your area within seconds. You pick the best deal offered and follow through with the dealer to sell your car. No more managing scammy emails from buyers on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. No more time wasted on no-show buyers. No bait and switch with a, will you take a check excuse from sketchy buyers. Now keep in mind, these offers will be for trade-in values of your vehicle. If you want to go through the hassle of getting more for your car, that's up to you. But if you want to sell your car hassle free and fast, go to tflcar.com and click Sell Your Car in the navigation menu. Or click on the High Road ad at the bottom of the website if you're on mobile, or click on the column if you're on a desktop. High Road makes it easy, and we like easy. Mm. Which is not an easy feat because at that time there were no roads. Not really. I mean, there there were there were paths that horses took, but they were definitely not built for cars. Yeah, you could still take a covered wagon across America. No, you took trains. Trains were going across. Tra the trains were just they had just uh, done the Golden Spike. Yeah. In Utah, uh, so there were bridges that you could ride across on using you know the railway bridge, which is a little dangerous. And there was a guy. There was a guy who had tried it a few months or, uh, ahead of time. And the idea was, the hard part, of course, is the West. The easier part is when you get to Chicago and New York, because that was a little bit more built up. So the idea was, get the hard part over with first, and then get the easier part over with later. And this guy had tried it, not the guy, not Horatio, and he went kind of following the train route, the main train route, right. which goes through Nevada and got stuck in Nevada sand and called it. Oh, okay. Yeah, like, so this is the previous guy. So Horatio, he goes and he does it again. He goes and tries to do it right. on a whim. So he buys a car. I think it was called a Martin. I've never heard of it. Ever Martin? Yeah. There's Martin. There's Well, back then, there weren't that many vehicles that you could get. Uh, it was a gas one, not a steam one, right? It was gas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. 
Uh, and so he buys his car, finds like a bicycle mechanic, gets, I think, one spare tire. <laughs> I remember these wheels were, you know, like like today's bicycle, like they basically were the size of today's mountain bike tires. Just a little bit larger, perhaps, yeah. but not much. Yeah. Not much wider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gets one of those. Loads all, and these cars didn't have roofs. No. <laughs> didn't have windshields. Completely exposed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, get some goggles, get some, like, like driving clothes, which I suppose would be a trench coat. Uh-huh. This dude, uh, and eventually a dog named Bud, and they set across America. Unbeknownst, Nathan, uh, that for months on end, if not years, uh, both Packard and Oldsmobile were planning to take the record. No. And these were, these were sponsored teams, basically, by the manufacturer, where what they would do is they would take the car... Um, and the driver would drive them along the, the train route, and then they would send mechanics with parts ahead of them, and they would stop, you know, at a destination. The car would show up. They would get the car ready for the uh, next days, and, and you know, this keep was, on going. Yeah, yeah. This guy was just like, "Hey, we're just going to drive." Now, this isn't the Great Race, which came on a little bit later, by the way, which is a fantastic movie. I recommend that was around. Uh, that was just after World. No, it was just before World War One. No, there, there, there were no like evil henchmen and <laughs> and Tony Curtis. <laughs> it's one of the best movies ever. I know. It was my childhood favorite. No, no, this is real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but so, but the point is is that so so this guy is driving completely unprepared. Completely, really? Yeah. Knows nothing about. Has never driven a car before. Knows nothing about you know. And 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 then people in America had never seen the car. So wherever he went. It was like you know, like 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 a like a day off for everybody because they would all come running down the street. Mm-hmm. What you got there, a horseless carriage, my friend? Yeah, and, I told it. Yeah, and then especially after like this, these other two teams set off from San Francisco because then it became like this you know this race, right? So right. the newspapers jumped in on it, and he decided to go north, like to Sacramento and then to Oregon, basically to avoid um, the Rockies, Nevada. Oh, Nevada. Okay. Yeah, the, the sands. And so he basically went, it was called the Lincoln Highway. It wasn't a highway. It was just, a, it was just like a wagon road. Uh, so he basically went down what is today I-80. You know when you go. Th- I know exactly th- what I-80 From is. Utah down mm-hmm. Wyoming. Right. So he kind of went down that route. Um, so and, that means he went over the Donner Pass? Well, uh, apparently he, he, he didn't did. get his he, car. He did go over. He went to Tahoe, I think. So he did. <laughs> and like a week into it, he had, so he had a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he had, he had like spectacles. And like the first day he lost his spectacles. Uh, and like the first week, he had a coat on, and he had two hundred dollars, which back then was like you know twenty thousand dollars today, something like that. Yeah, in his coat, and he dropped the coat, <laughs> no. lost a coat. <laughs> so now he's out of money. So now he's kind of out of money and no spectacles and no spectacles, and you know he's he's facing two sponsored works teams that are that are you know set off like maybe I don't know like three or four weeks after he did. Mm-hmm. I won't give away the ending. But, no, they don't, because I think this is actually pretty compelling. It's, it's a good it's, start. It's really compelling, yeah. And, you know, Ken Burns does a good job of telling I, that story. He, it's like an hour and a half uh, documentary. But what was interesting, uh, and the reason I bring this up, and this is where it's going to get controversial, is that 99% of the people back then all believed that the horse was going to be the future of transportation in America. Yeah. Now, if, you asked, if you asked 100 Americans, 99 of them would say the car is just a pan in the fla- flash in the pan, it's this kind of, and most Americans at that point had, get this, never been more than 12 miles from their house. Because sure. that's as far as a horse and buggy can get in a day. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that, all of that is completely reasonable. And it's actually the same in Europe, except for your people were sitting there throwing feces at each other and, and having... <laughs> my people, but it's my people. <laughs> yeah, well, European the whole thing. I, I, Are you I, back to apes again? Well, sort of. <laughs> my family's been in the in the old west since uh, the 1870s, uh, at least on one side of my family. So there. Anyway, the point <laughs> is is that you have an excellent kickoff for a series worth watching. No, but the, no, that's not the point. Oh no, the point is the point is that like today when we're living through this change of going from gas to electricity, m- majority of people thought that. At that time, the horse was a flash in the pan, and yet within 20 years, the horse was relegated to, you know, racing around a track or maybe I, w- I was going to say like eating. farming, but or no, they stopped eating horses. But even even with farming, that turned to tractors, and the internal combustion car had just taken completely over. And, he, well, and keep in mind, back then they were all were also electric cars, and they were you know Stanley, sure. both the Stanley steamers, steamers yeah. yeah. So they were all three of them, kind of a dare I say horse race, um, and the horse lost. Um, and it's like today, right? And so, so I was thinking about that. Uh, you know, we get all these comments on all of our videos, like uh, EV junk. I'm just being, I'm paraphrasing, and that's being kind. Yeah. 
right? But most people in the comments, or at least a lot of people, don't believe that the electric car has a future in America. Mm. And, and I would say within 20 years, uh, internal combustion will be dead. I'm, I'll, put my, I'll put my marker down right now. Okay, and, and put I'll, your 50 bucks down. And I'll tell you why. 20 years. All I'll right. tell you why. Because EVs, I'm not saying they're better. I'm not saying they're less expensive. They're just much more convenient. But more importantly, Nathan, I was reading a study over the weekend, and they interviewed both men and women who had had EVs, right? Uh, and, and they want to know, would you go back to an internal combustion engine car? And guess what the result was? Probably a high percentage said no. High percentage of women said no. Like the majority of the women said no. And women shall rule the world. And women make up a lot of the buying decisions. And you know what the reason was? Hmm. What do you think the reason was? Why would most women not want to go back to a gas Because they don't smell bad or they're easy to maintain. I'll keep guessing. You could do better. What, what, what makes an EV so different from a gas car? What? Gas car, gas, gas. They don't smell. No. Well, gas. gas, gas, gas. What do you have to do with the, gas? Well, we're putting gas in the tank. The reason I don't like doing that is because it smells. No. Yes. No, no, women don't, no, women don't like doing that because gas stations are sketchy and they're... And they're so are places to plug in your EV. No, not at home it isn't, which is where most well, okay, people... Okay, yeah, the beef area at home. Right, so, so the reason that most women said, in this study at least, that they would never go back to a gas car was because they never have to go to a gas station. Okay. And, and I think that is an indicator of where we're going because gas cars... You know, are great. I love them. I, you know, don't get me wrong. We have a Mustang with a five liter, and I, I love that thing to death. But as a, you know, as a transportation tool, right? The EV is just much easier to live with. I think it'll take t longer than twenty years. I think that we'll have to transition, and I think a lot of people will be doing PHEVs. Also, there's uh, different hydrogen questions as, around as oh, well. Oh, that's just a red herring hydrogen. It's, not a, it's, not it's a, a complete. I love. Why are people putting billions of dollars into hydrogen but, but, technology? Well, well, why aren't they putting it into hydrogen technology infrastructure? You know, you could put it into. You the can't do the infrastructure until you have a product that actually. Yeah, of course, can there work. Are, of course, there's tons of products out there, my man. Come yeah. on, it's we've had too the Nexo here. Right now. It's, we've, we've had. We've had I, I know, but we see, you're uh, saying the same thing that uh, other people are saying about you with um, electricity. I'm, and what uh, I'm saying is that there's options out there. So, for okay, instance, okay. Here, well, no, okay, let, let me, let finish, me finish, finish one sentence while sorry. you have one. No, sorry, I'll, I'll shut okay, up. Please. Yes, go for so, it. So, let's say you have a hydrogen vehicle. Now, there's two different types of hydrogen. There's the one that actually can work as an electric, uh, basically creating electricity. And there's another one that can work in an internal combustion engine. And they're working on both. Now, let's say you have that with a PHEV style. And suddenly, you have a completely clean vehicle or whatever. And that may actually work in an industrial level, such as trucking and all that. And they're testing it right now. And Hyundai and Toyota have put billions into putting trucks on the road with those types of powertrains. So it's already out there. Granted, there is no infrastructure for it throughout the United States, except for like California and some of the east or whatever. And, and the infrastructure in California is going away. Well, it, I, there, at I'm one not point, there were like that. 55 hydrogen stations. Now we're down to like 15. I, I'm not debating that, but I am saying that they're still willing to put money into it. They're also putting money into biofuels and all that. By saying, by just putting down the statement saying 20 years, it's only going to be electricity, I think you have to think about the other people out there, such as oil companies, who are putting a lot of money into maintaining. Shell is building out an electric charging network. Yes, they are, but at the same time. Not a hydrogen network. They, they actually stopped on their hydrogen side in California. They're, and they're still making an awful lot of oil. Uh, and uh, they I'm not saying they're not making oil. So what I'm trying to say is that within 20 years, I don't think it'll solely be electricity. Right, let me ask you this. All right. Just a quick question. You get two phones. You can, mm. One is free. One you have to pay for. One is powered by hydrogen. One is powered by electricity. Which one are you going to get? That makes no sense whatsoever. It, it, it absolutely makes perfect sense. Uh, electricity is everywhere. You can plug an electric car in everywhere. Hydrogen is nowhere. And unless you actually, this is this was Tesla's, Electricity this is was, this was Tesla's magic, right? They actually went and created, and once again, I don't want to sound like a Tesla fanboy. I'm just being realistic and completely practical here. I'm not throwing in red herrings like like hydrogen or like, I don't know, some other some other technology that, that you know, fuels that, uh, biofuels that are made in Chile by Porsche, all this stuff that is, you know, way down the road. I'm talking about today and now, you can get electricity anywhere, and that's why if you get an electric phone, you can charge it anywhere. If you have a hydrogen phone, no matter what it costs, you can't use it. And if 
somebody were serious about it, they wouldn't build the vehicle. They would first build out the infrastructure. And by the way, in the documentary, mm -hmm. there were no gas stations. Exactly. And uh, you had to get them at mercantile stores. Yes, yes. You had to actually go and get a jug and like bring it out and throw it in your car. Exactly. I totally get that. You know, funny thing about that, um, not a lot of electricity things in 20 years ago, and mm -hmm. now there's a few. And in 20 years, there'll be a lot more. Hey, isn't it possible that there could be more, I don't know, other types of no. gas plants? No, no, nope, nope, it won't happen. No, 20 it won't, years, it won't, no it won't, other thing. It won't happen. I'll tell you why. Tell me why. I'll give you another example. Um, you know, I said 20 years, and I think I'm being very conservative with that. Norway, and given this I'm is Norway. I'm not following what Norway does. They eat herring no, all the time. Never mind. There's still people like we are. They still have the same needs. And, in fact, they live in a very cold environment. They, they, they tipped from, I think, 50% EV to almost 100% EV within, like, 10 years. Yes, for their regular daily driving cars. Yeah. And I have That's no problem with that. That's what I'm and by the about. way, I don't have a problem with EVs, but mm. how many tractors do they have that are running on all electricity? You know, they, they don't yet. It, there's still plenty of industrial vehicles that don't have running on all electricity. I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying But I'm going to say that's not 100%. So cars, yes. yes cars, yes. And I, there's a lot of people in the United States who truly do not need internal combustion, and they would drive every day with electricity and be happy as clams. And actually, in the end, they would save a lot of money if they bought a used electric car because there's less maintenance, blah, blah, blah. I've done it, and I know for a fact it works. However... I don't think that you're going to get enough people on board, even in two decades, to completely switch over to all transportation being electric. No, I said cars. Not Car, all. Well, all, I'm sorry. Okay. All personal transportation yeah. being cars. Well, I, I guess, I just, I it's, guess. it's the pickups that are going to be a huge problem. The, I, I guarantee you that the upcoming uh, PHEVs that are coming up, those are going to last a long, 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 long time because you have that greater range and because you have that greater torque and because you have that easier you know, reliability, at least mentally speaking, for having a truck that can go a long distance and tow. You can't do that right now with electric cars. And I honestly do not see, even in a decade, how they're going to get an electric pickup truck to tow decently. Yeah, I mean, uh, let me put it back to where I started, right? Right. You could. What I'm hearing you saying is, you know, you can hook up Betsy to a cart and, you know, you can, you know, have her pull it across uh, the country, or you can have her pull it across the field. Mm -hmm. How many people are going to switch to this internal in, in car that makes a lot of noise and scares people? And if you go over 20 miles an hour, the human body is not going to be able to take it. That's kind of what I'm hearing you say in some ways, because that's the same thing people were saying back in the 1900s. And yet, like that, it switched over, because at the end of the day, no matter what your beliefs or politics are, when a better technology comes around, if... It's a given, and you know, I would say fair playing field. The better technology wins, and I'm not saying that, that, I, I that would agree. electricity is necessarily better. I'm just saying it's much more convenient, and in the long run, it's going to be much more prevalent because people are going to realize the convenience of it. And to me, I say that with a heavy heart, dude, because you know, I love internal combustion engines. I love the fact that there's this like living thing inside the car that's like having a beating heartbeat. That's you know, that's that I can go and work on and then you can supercharge or turbocharge and that you can get yourself green. All, all of that I absolutely love. But at the end of the day, convenience in America, at least today, is what, I don't know, maybe always will win the day. And electric cars are just much more convenient. You know, there's a large group of people who would disagree with you and they're called the Amish. They rock a horse like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> yes, that's true. You guys rock. <laughs> yes. You couldn't be watching this. Yeah, so you wouldn't. think there'll be like a, 20 years from now, there'll be a group of people who, you know, who. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> There's going to be some holdouts out there who are going to definitely. It, it, it'll be like Mad Max in some spots, I guarantee you. And I'm, probably Nevada is going to be one of those places, too, speaking of sand. So there'll be like and, a and yes, and yes, there are use and, cases where electric isn't as good. Trucks is, you know, a great example of that. You're absolutely right. Uh, but I think all it takes is like a leap in battery technology, which we're really on the cusp of getting to. I mean, and, and you may end up even seeing. And I, let's talk about trucks. Actually, I appreciate you bringing that up, Nathan. Okay, that's fine. Before we get to this, yes. So, so, so here's what I think happened with electric trucks. Do you remember, like, uh, must have been like four years ago at the LA Auto Show where they showed the Rivian R1T the very first time. Yeah, remember? Yeah, it was it was a huge hit, and everybody lost their you know what? Yeah, I did too. Yeah, everybody lost, and every and all of a sudden like Rivian just got slammed with uh, pre-orders, mm -hmm. and then the whole world woke up and said, "Gosh darn it, people really craving electric trucks, right?" And then then that was followed up to, with the Cybertruck, sort same of. thing, and the Hummer EV, well, the Ford Lightning. Not yet, but the Hummer EV also yeah. right there. I remember when that press release came out and they were 109,000. I'm like, what the? Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy money, right? Because there was just like, there was this almost like 
mad uh, fever that everybody had for electric trucks. Well, I yep. think that fever broke. Oh, I would agree. I think the reality, and I think the reality isn't even towing or hauling. I think the reality is trucks don't fit into people's garages. That's, that's not all. And they don't fit into people's lives because if you're in L.A. and you're rocking a truck, you know, imagine parking that thing. And there's a reason when you're driving down the 405 or the 110, you're not going to see a lot of trucks. You'll see some, obviously, work trucks. <laughs> you see plenty of trucks in L.A. Look, look, I, I get what you're saying. And uh, the, the packaging and the size altogether is is a problem for some people, especially something like a Ford F-150 Lightning or whatever. It's a full-size truck. However, what if it was a mid-size truck or even a small truck that was powered by electricity, which, by the way, is coming soon, whether we like it or not? Um, I actually think that's a much better application for electricity, using them in smaller, lighter pickup trucks that are not meant to tow 10,000, 5,000 pounds, but are there to haul stuff around and maybe tow 2,300, 2,500 pounds occasionally. That might be a better application for an all-electric pickup truck. Yeah, I, I'm just saying that most full-size, even mid-size trucks don't really fit into people's lifestyles if you live in a city, unless you, you like <laughs> Eastern Dallas, right? They're, they're, I mean, Roman, the, the numbers are against you on that. By the way, California, the highest consumer of pickup trucks in the United States next to Texas. Well, that's because Texas. California is the highest consumer of everything in the United yeah, States. Yeah, but, but by, st- based on population. Pickup trucks are the most popular I'm vehicles it, sold in the segments, and uh, Ford sold a million F-150 or F-Series I, trucks. I'm just, I just think if you live in downtown Chicago, L.A., New York, you're not rocking a pickup. Sorry. And that's where, you know, a large percentage of the population lives. If you live, <laughs> if you live in Dallas disagree. or Houston, it's a whole different thing. But in those cities, I just don't think they work with people's lifestyles. And I think what happened was people figured out. Remember the guy, um, uh, Rivian Dad, he came by? Yeah. And, yeah. So what he actually did in his house was he actually cut out like a little cubby out of out of his garage. So his truck could fit all the way yeah, into so his Yeah, so the garage. nose of his truck can fit in. And that I think that's an outlier. I just don't think the trucks work with people's lifestyles. And let's actually transition to some news because there is some news here. Okay. Um, first and foremost, this, this goes against what I'm saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Ford has delayed plans uh, for their next electric SUV, three-row, and for their next electric uh, truck. So they put they pushed it back to 2025 and 2026. Yep. Uh, in... in um, and they're going to uh, concentrate more on hybrids and plug-in hybrids? Yep. Uh, rumor has it that they're going to try to double the uh, production on their Mavericks in the near future with new Mavericks, but that's that's a rumor. And then the other, um, you know, it has not been confirmed, but it's, I'm sure it's going to happen. Uh, Ford is going to have a plug-in hybrid Maverick yep. and, a, and a hybrid Maverick with all-wheel drive as well. So right now you can have either all-wheel drive or hybrid. You can't have both, but the... All-wheel drive hybrids coming, as well as an all-wheel drive plug-in hybrid. This is what we're, yeah, but once again, they have not fully confirmed it. No, no, we're, this is not confirmed. But this is based on some good inside information. And it would make sense. The only problem is, once again, production. So that's where the rumor of uh, extending their production and increasing their production comes in, which they need to do because there's still people who are waiting <laughs> six to eight months to get their hands on their Maverick. Or even longer, I've heard some people say up to a year in some cases. So Ford has to catch up first. Anyway, uh, Horatio, uh, the first American road trip, it's on Amazon. Uh, if you want to see kind of where uh, the world was in 1903, they do a really good job. And by the way, get this, so that, that Packard team yeah. uh, that took off, uh, the PR guy uh, had them go through the Rockies. Guess how that went? That didn't go well. No, that didn't, no, go, that didn't well. go well at all. <laughs> no, they yeah. finished, but not, not in the lead. Yeah, yeah, the Rockies were a huge <laughs> challenge really up until the 1950s and 60s when they finally started building proper – highways to go through it. Uh, one other thing, by the way, speaking of Horatio, I highly recommend a series called Horatio Hornblower, swashbuckling dude who's kind of like the whole pirate uh, Imperial Navy thing. Old series, really good stuff, highly recommend it. Does you he just drive run. across country? No, but he, he drives a ship, like a British ship cannons and pirates and stuff. Cool stuff. All right, okay. uh, let's get to this list. Let's, so let's start with uh, the cars uh, that you're better off to buy new Instead of used. That's correct. Now, when, by the way, when we say used, it's lightly used, so only a right. couple years old at the most. At the most, yeah. Okay, so let's. you want to go from 10 to 1 or 1 to 10? Let's go from 10 to 1 in TFL fashion. And, of course, what we're looking at are vehicles that don't depreciate or they depreciate so little that you're better off to buy them new than used. Uh, so if you're looking for a car that's going to hold its value, this is the list. So number 10, Nathan, is what? The Kia Sportage Hybrid. It's uh, difference used over new is... 
negative five percent, and so that means that the difference is about two thousand eighty-five dollars. Yeah, five point nine percent. So it only lost about six uh, percent, give or take. Uh, the used price is thirty-three thousand three hundred eighty-seven. So if you're looking for a good mid-sized family hauler and you want a hybrid. Uh, go and get yourself a Sportage, but buy it new. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. buy that's the whole point right here, right? Yeah. So the next one is, number nine is the Honda Civic. No surprise here. They are very good at holding their values. Uh, their difference is used over new is 5.5% um, negative. Uh, so the difference financially is $1,577, bringing your used price to $33,397. Nope, so 26934 You're close. Whoa, sorry, 26900 Sorry, not wearing my glasses as I'm speaking. Beginning to need them, $26,934. Point being is that it's a 5% or 5.5% drop, uh, meaning that buying a brand new one makes a lot of sense. Yep, now number eight on the list uh, that IC Cars put together uh, is the Toyota RAV4 Hybrid. Uh, obviously, uh, the midsize uh, crossover, the most popular segment in America, it used to be the sedan. Now it's a crossover. They sell like 450,000 RAV4s every year around there. That's a lot, Nathan. And That's the a, hybrid, I believe, is about 25% of their, maybe even higher at this of point. Of their production? Yeah. It's uh, down 5.3% or $2,131 for an average use price of $37,727, um, which, you know, uh, once again, if you're at the dealership and you know there's a used one there, might as well go for the new one because you're going to get the benefit of the you know the full warranty uh, and that new car smell. Yeah, yeah. And some people just the idea of having being the first person to own the car is is quite uh, appealing. Oh, yeah. Is that do you like that? You like being the first person to own? The yeah, car? but you know it's it, it loses its luster after a little while, um, especially realizing that your car is depreciating. Uh, Really fast. So uh, having a car on this list, on what we're reading now, would be kind of good, I guess. <laughs> and the next one on this list, speaking of that, is the Toyota Corolla Hybrid. Its uh, difference used over new is negative 5%. So the difference used over new is a drop of um, $1,359. That gives you a total used price of $26,038. Yep, and the number six, uh, this is an interesting one because i didn't I, expect to see this no i didn't think they were selling that well uh but apparently they are or the people who buy them uh really like them because they're not selling them cheap used as a toyota sequoia hybrid nathan which of course is the three row that competes with the high high the highlander hybrid oh, I hate it when you yeah yeah the, but it sort of does um it's bigger it's, it's, it's a bigger it's a, truck. It's a truck yeah. it's a truck which yeah. so can tow more and by the way it comes standard as a hybrid so it's, and it's not a fuel efficient hybrid it's a power hybrid is the way to but look at it you do lose like um seat room because the, the battery yeah. lives under the rear seats and also there's a live axle under the rear seat as yeah. well so both those things make it the third row is very compromised but it is a proper truck, and I think it's one of the better looking trucks in its class. I like it better. I think it's better looking than the Yukon, personally. Um, the difference used over new is negative 4.6%. So the difference, you're only dropping $3,737, which is not much. Um, that brings the total to $77,653 used. Roman, I've seen these on the lots for about $75,000 new. Uh, because some people roll back the MSRP a little bit and they're trying to move some of their fleet. And that, I think, would be a killer deal for okay. a car like this, for a truck like this. Now, uh, interestingly, five and then four are both the same vehicle, the Ford Maverick and Maverick Hybrid. Yeah, but the uh, hybrid is the first one. Yeah, that's down 4.4%. The regular Maverick is down 4.1% for an average price for the uh, Ford Hybrid for 32039 and for the Maverick, 32505 That's... Dang, incredible, Nathan. Yeah, it is. The Maverick is extremely yeah. popular, even used, but new. They're just not dropping much because of their popularity. And frankly speaking, Ford has a complete and utter home run on their hands with these vehicles. The only issue I frankly have is the fact that they just didn't build more of them. And also perhaps having more variety, which is what we talked about earlier, that there may be some different models coming in the near future. You know, uh, this is a... This is a missed opportunity on the part of Rivian. As you know, Rivian just recently introduced the next two cars. Yeah. And they're they're like little... They little look, crossover SUVs. Yeah, yeah. And they look like little like Omni Horizons. Well, the little one does, yeah, yeah the, but, uh, the, the R3. But I think the missed opportunity there is a maverick size EV. I think. I agree 100%. I think if, if you could come up with... Like Toyota's is rumored to be building the Stout, which was the first pickup they brought to America, which is going to be a compact... 
based up, on the first yeah. pickup they brought on America is what he's meant to say. Yeah, yeah, and this is where obviously towing and hauling are not such a huge issue, right? Because these are tiny little trucks in, relative to you know to the rest of the world they're huge, but to us they're tiny. So I don't know why Rivian didn't come out with a small. Frankly truck. speaking, I would say that every automaker completely blew it. When Ford came out with the Maverick, we immediately predicted it would be a home run when we saw the stats, especially the hybrid. I mean, and the price, the entry level price at the time was around 20 grand, which is excellent for a vehicle like that, especially for what it gives you in the economy. And nobody else picked up that ball and ran with it. And Ford completely <coughs> owns that segment. Yes, there's the Hyundai Santa Cruz, which is a similar size, completely different vehicle, more car based, and more importantly, not a hybrid. And it doesn't have the same cachet as the Ford does. The Ford's really more of a truck. Bottom line, Chevrolet, General Motors, uh, Toyota, Nissan, all of them could have come up with something quick and dirty to fight it, and they didn't, and I think they totally dropped the ball and lost the opportunity to make some money. Now you're hearing about Mitsubishi getting together with Nissan. This is the new announcement, and they are developing a PHEV small pickup, a well, one-ton, they call it, uh, pickup, among others. Yes, it's happening, but not until like 2027. So... Think about that. It's it's a real shame, but at the same time, good for Ford. And, you know, I know that um, it's not just me kind of putting my finger in the wind and guessing at it. I know that because I just came back from the Fiat 500e drive. Uh, so Fiat, in Florida, right? Yeah, in Miami. Um, Fiat took their most iconic car, which is a Cinquecento, Nathan. People in the comments said, stop saying Cinquecento. We live in America. And I'm like, oh, come so, on. So what? You say Ferrari. What do you want to say, Ferrari? Yeah, it, it, that's what it's, it's, it, it's a cool word, Cinquecento. I love saying it. It just rolls off the tongue. Yeah, I mean, did you say lasagna or do you say pasta? I mean, come on. <laughs> come on, guys. Yeah, just give me a break on yeah, that. Ridiculous. Don't pay attention to those people. Uh, anyway, so um, this is the second version of it, right? There was a 500E. That was a California compliance car. That yeah, which was not – it didn't get a great mileage. 87 uh, miles already. But, but it was quick. It was, it was, quick. A, it was yeah. a zoomy little car. Yeah, so the new one, uh, 150 miles of range. Not bad. But I, I think it's going to be successful because, once again, kind of like the Maverick, the use case is just smart, right? It's a city car. You're not going to yeah. be cross-country tripping a Fiat 500e, right? It, it, it's going to be something – right now it would compete like with the Mini SE, which we owned, which only had 104 miles. Or even the Nissan Leaf, which is a bigger car, but essentially, at least with the base model, the mileage is the same. And did, did you know that the Mini SE, the electric Mini, was one of the best sellers in the Mini lineup? It doesn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah, it because, because the, minis don't sell the use case scenario is perfect for a, a small... S a small little car, perfect for cities. You know what those cars are great for? Those small, limited mileage uh, EVs? College towns. Yeah. Absolutely perfect for college towns. I would highly recommend those because they're so cheap to run. As long as you can have a place to plug them in. And then and now you're going from 87 miles. They doubled it to 150. Mm -hmm. I wish they had gone to 200, which you can get in Europe. That would be perfect. But, you know, 150 is still much better than 87. And it's just a very cute car with lots of tech. Well, and here's the thing, right? I mean, it kind of competes with the Bolt, sort of, kind of. Well, the Bolt, Bolt is discontinued, but it's coming back. Yeah, but the problem with the Bolt is, let's face it, it's just a little bit kind of, it doesn't have a lot of je ne sais quoi or dolte vicha is what they kept saying. Is it do, do, dolte vicha? The, you know, the love of life, basically. No, they said je ne sais quoi because apparently the Italians French, like yeah. to speak French. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It, it's just not, it's not like doesn't get the blood boiling. Whereas the, the Fiat 500e is much sexier and much kind of fun, more fun to look at. It's, it's a cool looking little car. Yeah, it's got like I, eyes. I, I, I really do like what they did with it. I'm surprised that Fiat's still here in the United States, to be honest with you. Uh, but one thing, did they mention bringing more product over here? They don't talk about future products. Oh, for crying out loud. That didn't even, no, no wink and smile. Did you know that the Fiat out of all, this is what they mentioned, which blew me away. Did you know that out of all the Stellantis brands, Fiat sells the most? Well, worldwide, yes. Worldwide, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they yeah. sell like over a million units. But they, they, they sell not, more than Jeep, more than Ram. Yeah, but that's 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 units combined. Right. Right. The so they have trucks and they've got, you know, various things that we just don't get here. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, well, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So, so anyway, I, I think it's going to do really, really well. It, uh, starting price is like uh, 32000 yeah. There, but everybody's going to lease them, right? And then yeah, and plus, well, you're not going to get the federal rebate unless you lease them. Yeah, so everybody's going to lease them. Yeah. Remember the old ones? You could lease one of those for like, uh, I think it was like either 79 or 99 bucks it, a it month. It was less than 100 bucks. Yeah, yeah, with no money down. Yeah, yeah. You could just basically walk in there and throw them a $100 bill and walk out with the car. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. Out. And then they've kind of made their way 
uh, into the entire country because they were only sold in California and then right. Oregon for a, you know a, a short while. And now you can see those because you can. I've even seen them in Colorado. Yeah, because they're orange, right? They're, they're, they're with a like, with a white uh, grill. You know, yeah. my best friend drove one for about six months. Like dreamsicles. Yeah, he had one in uh, San Francisco, which was a perfect place for them. The only problem was because it charged so slow, it was difficult for him to actually use it as a uh, commuter. The, the new one has an eighty-five kilowatt hour charging, which isn't yeah, grand. It's better than the Bolt. Yeah, it's at least it's fast charging, and it's better than the, the old SE. There's a new SE coming, by the way, Mini, which is also going to have one hundred and fifty miles of range, but. Uh, I digress, Nathan. Uh, if you want to see the review of the new 500E, go to LTFL. I also uh, did a retro review of the old one. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so, the versus. Yeah, so that's also going to be up at LTFL by the time you listen to this. Uh, so go check them out, uh, and then we'll have a driving review next week. All right, number three. One of my favorite cars, dude. What is it? It is the Mercedes-Benz G-Class, the vehicle that is behind us. For those of you who are listening, there's a beautiful G-Class behind us that's all blue with really horrible wheels. Okay, 2.3%. Uh, for an average uh, savings, if you buy it used, of four thousand five hundred, and the uh, used price, Nathan, one hundred ninety six, one twelve. You know, I've kind of given uh, the G wagon was my kind of dream yeah. vehicle. I've kind of given up on it. One hundred ninety six because you're not a Cardassian. Yes, I, come on, that's just yeah, that's just obscene. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a good it's good. I I love the thing, but one hundred ninety six thousand average price, no way, uh uh-uh, uh uh, uh-uh. no way. I'm not that. I, I, there's like. There's probably ten cars that would get my blood boiling just as much that I could buy for that 196. Okay, well that's this year. Let's see where Roman is. No, no, no. It's not just this year. Twelve months. All right, number two. This is interesting. Uh, the Kia Rio, which is their little budget. Uh, my dream car. Okay. Well, you know yeah. why? Because it's cheap. It's down only 0.1 percent. Basically, twenty one dollar difference between the new and the used one at eighteen thousand six eight. You know, they're really good little cars. They're just. If you had a sticker, like a generic car sticker that you could put on a car, it's like car. That would be the best definition Didn't they of it. Did they it, though? Uh, no, they're bringing uh, at New York Auto Show. They just introduced a new one. Did they? Yeah, I think so. I thought they just – anyway, um, I mean the reason I think that it's a good car to buy new is because in that segment there's nothing left. There's a Versa. Right, and then there's a Mitsubishi uh, Mirage. That's, there, that's there, all you have. Yeah, there's there's only a handful of cars that Under are going to come around the twenty thousand dollar mark, yeah. and it's a good car. Gives you a lot of standard features, and it's it just does its job. If you want no frills, but you don't want an EV, that's a car to look at. And this one is a complete surprise. Number one, the only car on this list that costs more to buy used than new. This so, doesn't make any sense to me, but okay. All right, and yeah, this is crazy. But they get their numbers from you know sales reports. I know. So it's the Land Rover Range Rover. It, it, the difference is a used one will cost you 2.8% more, more than a new one or $4,067 4, for an average used price of $147. I, I have a theory because I, <laughs> I thought about this when I saw this. And they're beautiful, but dude. <laughs> no, no, no. I, my theory is just because one model and the other model are different from one year to the next. And I think that people are dropping more money on this because they don't want the newest one. They want the previous one or the other way around. They want the new one, yeah. So you want the new one, and you're willing to pay more money for it. Because it's the same car, same model. It's the same car. Then there's no reason to spend more money on this thing. Damn it! Why would you? Why would you guys spend four thousand dollars more? I mean, I mean, the reason is because you can't get the new one, so you're stuck buying. So, so, so you're stuck buying what? Yeah. They got. So you go to the dealer, and they're like, "We can get you a new one. It'll take six months, or you can have this guy for four thousand dollars more. Yeah, which you can have now." Like Why that, would you do a markup happens. if you're JLR? I mean, they're in desperate need to sell no, they're, the vehicles. They're not. This isn't JLR marking them up. This, this is, is a this, this is what they're going for. Yeah. Right? This is the, this is the going price. All right. Shall we move on to the cars you're better off to buy used? In other words, the cars that depreciate um, that uh, actually don't hold their value very well. And number ten, I would buy all day long. And I think that's just because um, nobody wants a sedan anymore. So and this you is, like Mercedes. Well, I mean, this is their flagship, the Mercedes-Benz S-Class, down 31% or 45000 You can get one for ninety nine, just under 100000 used. Yeah, okay, enjoy. Um, I just, <laughs> no way, absolutely not. Never because buy. Old man car? Well, yeah, yeah. And, and also maintaining and stuff, it's, it's expensive. And but the Range Rover is also there's expensive no passion. to maintain. There's no passion. Okay, all right. That car has no passion. There are cars on this list that do have passion. You know what it's got? Hmm. It's got really soft uh, headrests, like like super cushy. 
There's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, yeah. I I, I was recently in a uh, Mitsubishi that had soft headrests too. So, uh, speaking of Mitsubishi, let's go to number nine, which is the Nissan Murano at thirty two percent. So basically, it drops thirty two percent, meaning that um, the used price is twenty nine thousand four hundred and fifty eight dollars. Hmm. Um, I just redid the Murano. Yeah, it, I I don't like it. I, I just have never. It used to be okay, and then they put the CBT in there, and it was less okay. But they did. The, they they kind of redid the interior. It's much nicer. It's prettier, yeah. but it's just it, it still doesn't drive. I think competitively with other vehicles, and so I would say buy used if you're going to buy one. All right. Number, uh, number, now, the beginning of what I like. Uh, Rap Italiano. Alfa Romeo Stella. Dolce La Vice. Well, yeah, that's Dolce La Vice. That is, of course, the uh, SUV slash crossover. Uh, we'll get, just wait for the, uh, <laughs> just just wait for like the sedan. <laughs> oh my still, God. It's also on this list. You lose $17,495. You can get one for an average price of $36,630. Yeah. It's down 32%. You Make know, sure you get the extended warranty, my friends, even used. You know, um, there's just, so much fun. There's just a, uh, there's, so all of those Italian, so Porsche, of course, took, uh, the SUV and made it, um, something that everybody wanted with the Cayenne. And then every automaker eventually followed. I'm talking about automakers that were traditionally non sporty automakers. Oh, okay, so you're saying a sporty because right. Ford did it with the Explorer yeah, no, forget, way the, back. Forget Ford and Toyota. I'm, I'm talking about. You're talking about a sporty vehicle yeah, that like happens Ferraris, to be Bugattis, Lamb- oh, Bugattis, BMW no, did it with the X5. Too. Yeah, and so they all did it. Uh, and uh, I, by the time the Stelvio came out, I was just bored of him. Okay, that's that's you know it's weird I mean, I mean, that a what, guy named Roman is not going to like an Italian vehicle. What, what really they, is what, beyond what, me. What did they? What did the Stelvio add to that whole? Oh my line, god! Whole lineup of they cars. They sound so good. They oh, drive great when you willy push them. When the drive shaft doesn't fall out, they are <laughs> absolutely extraordinary. That's a Julia the Nathan. interior. Well, uh, the same car basically, just larger and smaller. The uh, interior is beautiful in there, hand-stitched Italian leather. Oh, my God, it gets my juices going just thinking about it. And if you're Uh, decadent enough to buy one of those and have some fun, you know what it means? It means you're not a stodgy old man sitting in the corner being grumpy when you're driving your German car. You're out there living life in your Italian car. All right, this is going to make me sound like an EV fanboy, which I'm not, but I'll tell you the way I think about this, right? Uh, Uh, Just another crossover with different leather and different colors and and different tune on the engine. It's it's not as exciting or interesting as like a Tesla Model Y, which which completely rewrites the way cars work. I'm not saying Tesla is better or more engaging. But it's more interesting to me because oh the technology God, so part wrong. is so different from, oh, now you have this leather versus that leather. No, it's not just the now leather. You, have, you yeah. haven't taken your chair at all today, my friend. No, you no. are so uh, no, on the crank I, 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 on this. Dude, if you're going to get Stelvio a... was such a sexy uh, fun. Uh, it's one of the few crossovers that actually has a little tiny bit of sex appeal to it. I'm, I'm saying if you're going to get a sports car, get a freaking sports car. What? And I don't care if, if an X6M handles as well as you know an M3. I just don't care. Get the freaking M3. No, get the sports car. No, don't get the don't get the giant crossover with you know with, with your giant. family, you know that that the, the tall crossover that you know sits 15 feet and no matter what magic they do to the suspension, it can still go around the ring at the same time. With the sports car, get the sports car. No, yes, no. You right. know why? Why? Because old men like us have osteo issues, and so getting in and out of a sports car is a bit of an issue. However, when you have a nice, tall SUV, you I mean, can just scooch my tush right over and yeah, sit in that yeah. fine Italian leather. Like, yeah, yeah, it just makes you like 10 years older already. I, I'm fine with it. I don't care. Okay. It's great to drive. It's just terrible to own. All okay, right. now speaking of these electric vehicles that you marvel at, oh, uh, the Volkswagen, Volkswagen ID4, ID4 is number seven. I just drove by the Volkswagen dealership. There's like a hundred of them there. Oh yeah, they're piled up like cordwood, dude. <laughs> because I, you and I made the prediction that they should have opened with the ID Buzz, yeah. at which we're still uh, waiting for in the United uh, States. Volkswagen, you know... They, completely dropped the ball. No, but it's on everything. Like they, It's such a head-scratcher. They have so many cool products, and they keep leading with like the most boring, least interesting vehicle. Like... It, like the buzz should have been here five years ago. Uh, it's all over Europe. Yeah, they, they, it might be here. It might be here before the end of the year, which is the van. Maybe so the buzz is the van, right? It's same thing with the buzz, yeah. same thing with the Amarok. I have no idea why that's not here. And they keep bringing in these cars that are just boring because we're being punished because we're Americans. They Down 30, this, they 33%. Yeah. $15,000. We don't want you having that. For an average of 31. And it's interesting for all you uh, EV haters, there's only actually two EVs on this list. You No, three. Three, sorry. Three. three EVs. So you four. Think, okay, four EVs. No, <laughs> three. Not, there's three. Four. 
There's the ID4, there's the ID5, don't, don't. there's the EV6, and there's the Nissan Leaf. That's four. Okay. <laughs> All right. All Nathan right. wins once again. All right, number six is, is the, the Hyundai, Hyundai Ionic, Ionic 5. 5. One of my favorite EVs, by the way. I would buy this. Yes. I would buy this. Uh, living in Los Angeles, I would drive uh, this all day long. You know, I was at the uh, – uh, oh, God, I went to Korea for this car. I feel like – This uh, is the 5, not the 6. This is the – oh, I'm at number 5, which is the Kia EV6. So we're at Ionic 5, Kia EV6. Oh, okay. Well, we haven't done the Ionic right. 5 yet, so, yeah. so you I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm kind of squishing them together because uh, – Oh, okay, because they're related. I yeah. get it. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, there? although the prices are very different. Yes. $2,000 difference, hence my choice is better. I, I agree with you, Nathan. I buy the Ionic Five. It's uh, you know groundbreaking in terms of its design language. It's eight hundred volt architecture. Makes it's it, utilitarian. Yeah. It's a good hatchback. It's very comfortable to drive. You sit nicely. Great power. Handles great. I drove one cross country solo and loved it. Absolutely loved it. And I love the looks of it too. It has had an Italian look to it. Oh, I said Italian again, Robin. So the Ionic Five is down sixteen thousand eight hundred for an average price of thirty four. The EV Six, that's a Kia, is down eighteen thousand eighty one for an average price of thirty six two four three. And number four, Nathan, uh, is the Alfa Romeo Giulia. That's there you right, go. baby. The, the more sedan. sex and passion that's, right there. It's actually down more than the crossover. So don't <laughs> listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> so that sedan that Roman was talking about. Get the sports sedan. Yeah, it's even. Uh, yeah, uh, another. But I, I really do. Uh, look, I totally agree with you guys. You're like, hey, you buy that stuff, you're in deep trouble. Yes. So always buy one with a fierce warranty, right? Um, but the Alfa Romeo Giulia is just a beautiful car to drive. It's so comfortable, and it handles beautifully. Even the base model four-cylinder turbo, Andre drove run, uh, cross-country, and he loved it. The tech is horrible. The screen is tiny. The, the screen is a bit small. The, uh, the design Andre is, was, had an Italian accent when he got out of the, the car. The design is incredible. Yeah, he did. Uh, well, that's hard for you know Andre. Yeah, it is. He's a very bad actor. A terrible actor. I don't mean like a bad guy, but... <laughs> a bad, just, pro yeah. Properly a bad actor. And I'm a bad actor, too, so I mean... The only good actor in this team is Nathan. I'm a thespian. <laughs> he is. Uh, but, yeah, I agree, Nathan. It's a gorgeous car. Uh, very sexy. But, Sounds great. Uh, the Italians make four-cylinder and six-cylinders especially sound so good. Nobody else can make a V6 sound as good as Alfa Romeo. The Quattrofolio would be the one to get. Well, yeah, uh, obviously. But of course. Even the, once again, even that four-cylinder, really spectacular performance. Okay, let's move on to the next one. <laughs> you know what's not on here? The I-Pace or the E-Pace. But, but the, the F-Pace is out of production now, isn't it? Are they both out of production? I want to imagine. I, you know, you know the problem with Jaguar is a freaking name. What, 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 who came up with this I-Pace, E-Pace, F-Pace crap? It's very confusing. I would say somebody who should be fired. Yeah, what, what are you doing, Jaguar? Jaguar's always had a weird naming convention and made things XLE, XJE, XJR, XR, blah, blah, blah you know, JS, so whatever. The, so so just, just, just to, you know, put a fine point on this, the E-Pace is a small crossover, right? right. While the I-Pace is the electric vehicle. Makes no sense. Yeah. I, why? Who, who? Where did the... Wasn't there a meeting, you know, somewhere at the headquarters where yeah, people... Yeah, and they're working for Volkswagen, though. Like, hey, ev everything that's EV is E, so why are we making the electric car an I-Pace? Yeah, I know. And, and it, well, that's the joke. I mean, Top Gear came up with this years ago that it had to be blue and there had to be an I in it in order to make it, um, you know, electric, which makes... iPhone-ish. Yeah, which makes just no sense to me whatsoever. Uh, call it what it is, you know. So the F Pace, by the way, I like the F Pace. I do too. It's it's. I think it's a brilliant vehicle to drive. Very comfortable, very luxurious. I have no problem with it. However, uh, buyers do because it dropped thirty five point four percent. So the difference, new over used, you're losing twenty eight thousand five hundred and fifty five dollars for a grand total used car price of fifty two thousand ten dollars. Yeah, if there's any brand that needs to re reinvent itself, it's definitely Jaguar. Desperately, I, I, I think Jaguar is just now the whole brand has kind of been painted with the same brush of of old man, boring and unreliable. Yes and yes. I think there's some little tiny bits here and there. I'm not saying that's, that's true. I'm just saying that's that kind of what... Some it, of the image. I, I wouldn't yeah. completely disagree with you, but I think that they need they need to reinvigorate the entire company. Basically, fire half the staff. I'm sorry. Bring in, not necessarily new blood, bring in logical blood. Bring back the well, they, they keep they, Well, they keep bringing on new CEOs and they keep changing where they're going. So, you know, so maybe you guys become the premium something either premium sports car. What I mean by premium, I mean like very expensive. Maybe you go like into the 200,000s, right? No. So, so, you, so you're so you up there with Bentley 
but, no, but you fully. differentiate you somehow differentiate yourself with Bentley, whereas Bentley is more a luxury. You become more sporty, something like that. They've been trying to do that against BMW for years and years, and they've been failing. What they need to do is they need to go into a slightly different segment, make themselves unique because they're the sports car, luxurious sports car, the Jag that gives you. More for the money. That's what I think they should do. I think they should actually undercut these other guys and go for the jugular, the jagular. Yes. Okay, let's move on. Uh, this one is not a surprise, but it is in terms of money. You like the F-Type, by the way? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I like the F-Type, yeah, too. Yeah, the F-Type. I would buy the F-Type. It's, it's pretty. But it, once again, F-Type, F-Pace, it's, it's all so confusing. Big, fat, bald guy driving an F-Type is just weird. So the F-Pace is a crossover. The F-Type is a two-door sports car. Yeah, but, but once again, the name convention is just yeah, terrible. Yeah, you would know Type it. and Pace? Come yeah, on. Yeah, I know. That makes no sense. You would know it, yeah. All right, Fire number, whoever said that, okay? Jack. Number two. Uh, number two is the Nissan <laughs> Leaf. A big surprise. Um, Nissan Leaf, by the way, is one of the oldest electric vehicles out there, period. Um, yes. I mean, they, they predated Tesla in terms of the Tesla they Model did. S, I at did. least. <laughs> True that. Um, and their, <laughs> their tech is really old, so it, it's evident in terms of pricing. So their drop is 45.7%. What the hell happened to Nissan, right? I remember I, I saw the Leaf at the 2009, Nathan, Detroit Auto Show, mm -hmm. along with the uh, 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 Tesla uh, Model S. Right? That was the mock-up of the Model S. Yeah, and the Model S was sexy and fast and cool, and the Leaf was boring and uh, old tech at this point, right? Non You're talking about 2009? Yeah. In 2009, it wasn't old tech. It was new tech. But No, it wasn't even them. It was like even the batteries weren't, you know, they had The, the gel pack configuration, granted, I mean, they were air-cooled and stuff like that, but they were still, at the time, the cheapest way to get electricity to a vehicle. That was the whole point. Go Charles Gonzalez. He was the one who uh, wanted and, that and, car to be and, as and, inexpensive as possible. And in those 15 years, that's forward today, right? Tesla has built five different models. Mm -hmm. Model 3, the Model Y, uh, the Model X, and now, of course, the Cybertruck. Six, because the, they had a Roadster. Right, six. And, and, and Nissan has been able to pull one electric car out of there, you know what, which is the Aria, which does not... Does not you know lead in any segment? No, say. it's a good car Except though. Don't get me wrong. I think no, it's a good car, car, but it, the only segment it leads in is cost, and they had to drop no, the cost. It's still too expensive. Yeah, yeah. So what were they doing, Nissan? What were you doing those fifteen years? They fell asleep at the wheel, and they didn't see the uh, return on their investment that they thought they would see. I think with the Leaf initially, and even the, though they sold at first, it was the best selling electric and, car. And where's the Nissan Hybrid? Oh, uh, that, well, that's what they're working on with Mitsubishi right now. That's why they made that announcement. Because they don't have one. Exactly. So yeah. they need to bring one in, and that's why they're working with the Mitsubishi, who does have and this, hybrid tech this and PHEV tech. This goes directly back to Carlos Ghosn, who saved the company. And but, tortured but, the but, company. And tortured it. Mortgaged the future for the present. And you can exactly. say the same thing about the GTR at this point. At this, you know, at this you point, know, I'm seeing that with Stellantis, too, my friend. Yeah, well, that's a whole, we'll that's have that a whole different conversation. But, but here's, here's a thought I had, right? Stop selling the GTR, for God's sakes. You're actually hurting your brand image at this point, right? Yeah. Because it just keeps reminding people of how old and antiquated your technology is. At one point, this was Godzilla, the king of... And now, I see the GTR, whatever it is, $200,000, and I think to myself, at best, this is a money grab. At worst, this makes the reputation of the company seem like, you know, they're still trying to save on, you know, hold on. It's like, a, it's like an aging rock star or aging actor, right? They're trying to glob on desperately to the glory days. And, it, and by selling this thing, you're reminding people of those glory days, and you're reminding people not of who you were, but who you are, which is this company in desperate need of new tech. Yeah, it's it's definitely a new, a new product. It's the mark. Yeah, feel yeah. I'm of, sorry, uh, Nissan, but there's some I, hard love for you. Now, the rea I, I agree with Ron. What, what I think you guys should have done is, I don't know, maybe uh, change the vehicle in a decade. Uh, that would have been a good idea. And, but let's go back to the Nissan Leaf because I didn't finish. Um, you can buy, you can lease one in Boulder for like for hundred bucks. Yeah, hundred. I bucks actually looked it up because bucks, of my daughter. Uh, hundred bucks a month, no money down. So the used car price of this drops to eighteen thousand seven hundred and fifty six dollars, and that's before incentives. Okay, and there's quite a few available for the Leaf, which is a huge thing in itself. Um, I actually talked to my daughter and said, hey, you know, if you wanted to get rid of that crossover or that you're driving, which is gas and all that stuff. You could get a Nissan Leaf for ninety nine bucks a month. That's the base model S. If you wanted to go to the SV, I think it's like one hundred and fifty bucks a month. Yep. And you know what? It's not a bad thing because it's taken care of by Nissan. You just bring it in regularly for I don't know what they're going to you know rotate the tires. 
And then when you're all done with it, you walk away. The bad part is I'm not a big fan of leases normally because you, there's no equity, you know, really when you're done. But, man, it's a hell of a deal. And it's not a bad car, even though we both give it grief for it being old, and it is. Have you heard of too many of them really having major malfunctions, fires, or major issues? Have many of them been considered unsafe? The answer is no across the board, no matter what you guys say. And that's because the car is considered a pretty good product in that respect. It's just Well, it should be old. After, after so many years. <laughs> all, all these years, they better get it right, yeah. right? All right? Okay, let's get the last one. That's all you. All right, number one uh, is a car I would buy in a heartbeat because... Um, so the story came out this week. Nathan, that Mercedes is rethinking their electric car strategy. They probably should. They probably should. So it's the number one car is the Mercedes-Benz EQS, which is obviously the electric version of the S-Class. Uh, it's down almost 50%, 47.8, down $65,000 for an average used car price of 71231 Now, I went on the launch of this car. I loved the car, Nathan, except for the hyperscreen. All wheel steering. Yeah, the steering's uh, cool. Uh, incredible technology. Performance. Really good performance. And the problem is down to one thing, styling. They, they basically just blew it in styling. Well, it's right? a bar of soap. It's, it's a, bar, a bar of soap a, that they, just, soap. They, they shaped yeah. to make it as aerodynamic as possible, yeah. hence helping its efficiency. But Mercedes dropped an important thing that they used to be known for, and that was their style. They sacrificed the whole thing for aerodynamics, and in return, they made a car that, frankly, is difficult to look at. Yeah, the quality is there. You know, the tech is there. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's way better screwed together than a Tesla. Oh, way oh, oh, better. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's quick. Uh, I'm sure the battery technology, I'm, okay, I'm saying this, you know, we're only like three years into this production of this car. But I'm, I'm sure it's also well done because the Germans... They're about to change up and go to a new battery strategy but, as well. But it's just simply down to styling. I mean, what happened to the Coke bottle shape? Why did you make this thing, like Nathan said, into the most boring of soap bars, and then added some thrills onto it. You know, remember make... the, the late 90s S-Class, the way it looked? Yeah, I remember. And, and how just like, it looked like it was it has to have a road badass presence. gangster. You need road Whoever presence. got out of that car had money and clout and class. And now you're getting out of the car and you're like, oh, maybe it's some dweeb who's on the internet. Um, it could be. It's just, that's the thing about it. It doesn't have any presence. It doesn't have any style to me. And, well, and, and actually, it's worse than that because it doesn't have that kind of like, like uh, lust factor, right? Or th th something that you, you you see the guy driving it down the road or gal, and you're like, that person has made it, and you can tell because they're driving that car. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Like you said, it, it it feels like what you see. It's kind of innocuous. Yeah, you see, if if you if you even notice it at all, which you probably won't. You'll be like some tech nerd is driving that thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, not, it's not a it's, car you, it's you, you aspire to. Yeah, and that's the thing about Mercedes. Mercedes used to always, in my mind, in my mind, I know that you guys might debate me, but they used to lead with tech and they used to lead with styling. They used to be like just brutal. But how, let me ask you this. Yeah. So behind us, like you said, is this a looks good. Is a G wagon except for look, the wheels. Look, look how squared off it is. Look, yeah. Look, look at the design language there. Oh, it's a truck. And it's probably the Ish. most, I would say, aspirational, desirable Mercedes that in in in, in the entire lineup. Mm -hmm. So why didn't they like the designers put this up on their inspiration board? Instead of you know a, a bar of Dove soap, what what happened? How do you how do you not see? You sell these things, you can't buy them. They're 190 whatever it was, 96 thousand dollars on average, and then you completely you know disregard this because this was designed you know for the Shah of Iran 35 years ago, and you go with the current design language. I, I don't get it. I uh, agree with you. I would say that this is probably not the best example for an S class, but I get what you're saying in terms of bold. Right. In terms yeah. of just Road long, presence, you know, square jawed. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, it, it it is a bit of an issue, and it's a real shame because the tech. Once again, Mercedes has really good tech, but if they have a car that you're looking at and like, it's the simple thing of when you're walking away in a parking lot, do you look over your shoulder and like, huh, that's my car? No. Here There's I, other cars on this list that you do do that with, but not that I, one. I have a simple answer. Yeah. Buy Lucid, because they're, they're also kind of... I don't think uh, they're very pretty. Teetering. And just put a Mercedes bands on the Lucid <laughs> and call oh, it done. That's your new S-Class. Right? Hey, man, buy I, the Lucid. Buy the Lucid Sapphire, right? I mean, it's got it's good range. It's, it's, it's 100, 1, 2, 3, 4 horsepower, 1,234 horsepower, 0 to 60 in under 2 seconds. Uh, yeah. People say it's the best handling sedan or best handling car they've ever driven. The reviews, I mean, we've never driven one, but that's what... You drove it in a parking lot. Okay, yeah, that's fair. That sucks. <laughs> but but that's what the reviews are. That should be the Mercedes-Benz 
S class. That I should, would agree in that and, respect. And Mercedes, yes. you can buy that. You could probably buy Lucid because right now we're, we're rocket living, change for Mercedes. Look, I, I, obviously Fisker is. You know, they're not. They're not spiraling in the toilet. They're. You know, they're. They're circling the drain. They're, they're down the drain at this point. Not quite. They still have one or two little gasps of breath left. Not much. Not much. Uh, Rivian. Uh, they'll be okay. They have enough investors. People say that. I don't know. I think I think Rivian will be fine. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, well, it, well, I, I, it's going to take some time for them to to pull up. But that's why you saw a whole bunch of the new products. They've done a ton of cost. Well, yeah, but that those new products aren't coming for like two or three years, right? Two, they did that to boost their stock price. Well, the other one starts in a year, but supposedly. But that's not good. That's not quick enough. Right, that's that is not fast enough for that company because well, well, I, so they, they, they stopped so production be. on their factory in Georgia. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're moving production of the new vehicles to their normal plant. They fired a ton of people, uh, and their cash burn is still. And basically, the, the the rub on Rivian, from the insider's perspective, is that they lose like twenty thousand dollars on each vehicle they sell because it's over engineered. Which I applaud, but it's not a way you you know build which a sustainable company. Which is why company. the lesser vehicles are coming, and those won't be as expensive but, to engineer but, and build. But it might be too little too late. They might be, but they might not be. Yeah, I, you're, you're, you're half full, I'm half empty. But Well, that tends to be the case, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. But Lucid, you know, they, they have the Saudis backing them. Yes. Uh, but that that is certainly a company that has, the problem with- They should the have opened with, Fis- with their SUV, dude. The, the, yeah, the, yeah, exactly, of course. The problem with Fisker, is that they really don't have any proprietary tech. They've got proprietary design. they got great design. They actually have a running gear that seems to be okay, but their tech is just dreadful. But, but the tech and the, and, the, and the skateboard was purchased by something that Magna designed. Yeah. And they just put their styling on top of it. So, what you know, there was a rumor that Nissan was going to buy them. What are you going to buy? You're buying what? The well, Alaska? that's why Nissan pulled out. Yeah, Nissan nothing. pulled out because they got Mitsubishi to agree to this joint venture where they're going to be putting together electric vehicles and PHEVs, and they don't need a company like Fisker. That's why Fisker failed. Well, are they? Get, well, I mean, what are they getting from Fisker? Just some design? No, they're not getting anything. They're not. That's the thing. Right. Nissan's done with them. I'm saying there's no reason for Nissan to buy them because there's not getting. There's nothing to get. That's exactly it. So, so um, that's a problem. They had right a pickup truck, which didn't happen. But with Lucid, you've got some of the best technology that's proprietary to Lucid, right? Yeah. The, the, the engineer who start who's used to be. Well, he used to be Tesla. Yeah, yeah. So you've got this incredible motor. Uh, you've got you know a lot of tech that a lot of people want, and I think Mercedes would do well to consider buying them. Maybe it might be cheaper than redesigning the entire. S E Q S line. Well, they need to be more competitive, that's for sure. But the good news is, is that Tesla, for those of you who don't like Tesla, they're in some trouble right now. I mean, their sales are down. They built more cars than demand, which is not a good thing. Uh, so Tesla right now is hurting, and this is a first. So maybe it's time for Lucid to step their game up, or maybe Alaska. You know, with change comes opportunity, possibly. Possibly. And who knows? Maybe, maybe in 20 years, Tesla will convert over to internal combustion <laughs> and totally blow Roman's theory out of the water. You go, Elon. Make it happen. I, I, I would, you know, I, I would not put that by uh, Mr. Musk. He, he has, fl- he has flip flopped so many times. You never know. Uh, over the years, in terms of his, not just his core beliefs, but his politics, you know, what, he's, what he stands for, that I, I would not put it past him to sick. You know, uh, a Hellcat engine in the next model. What's that? Sexy cars. What? What? What have they done? done they, they, it's, I think they're off the range the, now. The e, they don't know. The E, the Tesla Model E. We need an E still. Yeah. Well, that was the Model Three. See, if you turn three sideways, oh, it's E. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Uh, uh. No, no, they're already at sexy. Okay, but how about a C? What was a C? There's no car. Cybertruck. That's Cyber a C. Truck. Yeah. Right. So they uh, now need to R. Yeah, the Hemi-powered uh, Tesla Model, Model R. R. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that'll go over well. Speaking of Model R, for those of you who didn't know, we actually had a Volkswagen uh, Golf R uh, that we're testing right now, and we recently did a live broadcast with that vehicle versus the Ford Mustang GT, and by now that is now a proper video, and I highly recommend you check that out. Yeah, if you guys want to kind of interact with us, uh, we actually um, were able to upgrade our internet here at the office to, to fiber finally. It's God. actually working and so now we could go live, and so we're going to be doing a lot more live. I mean, the reason we started, we have eight YouTube channels, and TFL Now is where that lives. And the reason we started TFL Now way back in the day was to do live videos. Mm-hmm. It didn't turn out that way because the internet was too slow and unstable to actually go live. But yeah. now that we actually have fiber here, we can go live. And it's a great chance for you guys to interact with us, to ask talk questions. Directly. And talk directly. So we'll be putting up a lot more uh, live videos over at TFL Now. 
starting now. We just did one today. Yep. So look look out for those. And Nathan, we've got an hour. We have indeed. So uh, once again, uh, don't forget about Horatio the car blower. No, horn <laughs> blower is my first thing American road first trip. American road trip. Okay. Yeah. And also, also, I'm curious to what your perspective is on the next 20 years, whether or not we're going to go to all EV. And what do you think about this list? Is there a vehicle we missed? Let us know. Is, you think Horatio, the name, will ever come back? Or is it too... I like that name. Horatio. Do you know my son was almost named Enzo? I like Enzo. Yeah. I had a buddy yeah. named Enzo. My wife said no. And then I said Elvis. She said, hell no. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, what see, are you going to do? See you guys next time. Bye. Ciao.